Sandra. Um, well, actually, I think Phil was going, well, I want to welcome everyone tonight and um, please uh, accept our ability, you know, um, join us in our flexibility as we find out what this version of webinar will be um, and the system. But Phil is, uh, Mar Marquez, who is the chair of the art department was going to welcome us and I will let him from Santa Ana College begin the day. Well, thank you, Sandra. And thank you everybody for participating in this uh, dialogue. Um, as Sandra mentioned, I am the chair of the art department as well as the gallery director here at Santa Ana College. And we are honored to be um, teaming and partnering with um, with Sandra and Suvan and the rest of the artists to make this wonderful exhibition. Um, I also want to give a special uh, shout out to both Tim Campbell and Stephen Montoya for doing so much of the background work, the actual physical work, um, and also this technological work that uh, is far above my abilities. So I thank Tim and Stephen profusely for their hard work and their dedication. Um, I'm really looking forward to this, this dialogue. And without really any further ado, I think I really I just wanted to say thank you again and welcome everybody. And I believe uh, Gail Werner is going to give the land acknowledgement. Okay. Good evening and Thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you to Suvan and Sandra and Santa Ana College for bringing us all together. I'm Gail Werner. I'm part Cupeño, Luiseño, and Kumeyaay, which are three tribes that are located in San Diego County. I'm also of European descent. Santa Ana College is located on Tongva land and I respectfully acknowledge our presence as guests of the past, present, and future generations of Tongva people. Our exhibit, Stories of the Land, reminds me that the Tongva people's stories, songs, and prayers that have been passed down over thousands of years are interwoven with this land. Thank you, back to you. Thank you, Gail. So thank you so much, Gail. And I think we all want to acknowledge and the, the actual scenario, which we're just delighted. Suvan and I had a conversation, thanks to Tim, um, with Phil and with Shelley Heffler as well, who's president of the Southern California Women's Caucus for Art. So they are, all three of us, this leg has multiple, this table has multiple legs and the Women's Caucus um, Southern California has played a key role in sponsoring our participation and also um, just really being uh, thrilled to bring to the audience of a community college. We're, we're particularly delighted this is at the community college. We think that the idea of stories of the land, of artists telling individual stories is such a, a wonderful intermix with starting your educational journey. And the as you will discover tonight, each of our the 13 artists in the exhibition were in conversation with five tonight, but each of them tells a unique story. And at the end of the uh, hour, we'll put the uh, a website where you can either visit virtually or even better come to the college and, and have that time. The 13 artists um, include Kim Abeles, Mariana Barkas, Pilar Castilla, Danielle Eubank, Ilosa Guanlao, Meg Madison, and I'm horrible on pronunciation, so I'm apologizing in advance, Mary Rose Mendoza, Nida Oslin, Pamela Peters, Sinan Ravel, Linda Viejo, and Gail Warner. And this is um, the second exhibition that Suvan and I have done looking at the the interconnection between a lived human experience and the environment with this set of artists. And this opportunity, we really wanted to have each artist have additional work in the exhibition. And so it's been very fulfilling on our part. And as most of you know, Suvan and I are, as many of you are, multifaceted with both an art. We have an art, a curatorial. She's a writer, I'm an editor. 
Um, there's lots of different, you know, aspects that, that bring us to this place. And um, Suvon, I'm really also thrilled that this is in her home town. And it really has, I think, allowed the crucible that she holds of being connected to people, to environmental activists, um, and to education and the art, the arts there to, to really come to life. And I asked her why she wanted, we asked each other kind of why we wanted to do this. And she wanted to examine humanity's occupation of the natural world, featuring artists' personal stories, because it's her own practice as an artist and curator centers on exploring a lived experience of change. For myself, my art and curatorial practices are grounded in relationships and a belief that how we treat one another matters both to our lives and it totally reflects how we treat the environment. So um, with that in mind, Suvan is going to explain a little bit more of our format and will take us um, on our journey. And I would want to add, I did a, the actual exhibition itself, <clears throat> really in these 13 artists, they, the beauty that we have is that there is a wonderful intermingle of their experiences and also their roots. Um, they come from many, both different places. They all live in Southern California now, but different histories, different times, different ethnicities. Um, so Suvan, take it on. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, of course, I didn't open to the right screen. Pardon me, now I gotta shut it down. <laughs> Uh, we did rehearse. <laughs> we did. Yeah, it was, an hour it was and really half good at rehearsal. <laughs> okay, so we're, the panel tonight is telling tales while why artists tell stories about lives and land. Uh, Kim Abelis, Nita Osling, Pamela J. Peters, Linda Vallejo, and Gail Werner are going to join Sandra and I in a conversation. And really, this is a conversation. We want to get to know the artists better, how they think, what they think about. And for that reason, we've asked them to give us uh, slides. And they're going to tell you a little bit about the work they've been doing. Not all of it, of course, because they've each only got four minutes. So I'm going to start the uh, slide presentation now. Uh, they know how it works. Each, each slide is up for only one minute. And so they've got a total of four minutes to give it before it moves on. And uh, if they run over a little bit, please excuse us, but Sandra and I will pop in to say, thank you very much and we're moving on. Otherwise people's time gets cut off. Okay, so here we go. We'll begin with Kim. Go baby. Kim? You're muted. Actually, the piece that is at uh, Santa Ana College for the exhibit, and I was really delighted that Suvan and Sandra selected this. It's called Signs of Life. Um, it's based on a bigger series where I track uh, trees in the urban area. Uh, and what happened was I was interested to compare where the homeless encampments are compared to where the trees are in the same aerial view. Um, I lived downtown in LA for uh, about 35 years and the homeless population of course has increased quite a bit based on the economy and uh, you know the housing crisis that we have and um, so if I did this piece today, I'm sure it would be much more intense than it is. That I, I picked this piece as another one to show you. Um, this I did with the uh, Garage Museum of Contemporary Art in Moscow in 2019. And it's a new series of leaders. Um, in this case, it, uh, the full series is uh, there are 10 world leaders with their quotes from climate summits. They're done in the language that they presented them. Uh, Macron is an uh, unusual person that he always gives his international talks in English so that it reaches a broader audience. Um, and these 
particular plates were actually placed in the capitals where these people lead. So Paris, Moscow, London, and Berlin. I think I was quick on this one. I had other people put these pieces out. So I think for me, a lot of the work has to do with interacting with other people. And um, as the third one that I picked, um, this was based on an exhibit uh, by a collaborative team called Mule. It's at the California African American Museum and they actually ended up acquiring it for their collection. And it's based on um, sort of a strata of documents that relate to the way we view education in this country. So on the outer parts are actually um, legal documents of um, Latino, um, Japanese American, and uh, of course the Brown versus Board of Education is a big case. Uh, so legal cases where families were trying to get their kids to have a decent education. And as you go in the quagmire of this uh, piece, it's actually about the personal effects that a kid would have when they're actually going through school. So for me, this really balances like the personal and the family part of what an education is and also the grander scheme of the legalities of it. Oh, there's a fourth one. Um, I'm actually installing the last of these. There'll be six total on the Park to Playa Trail in Los Angeles. Um, they are about six feet or eight feet long and they are native seeds. All of them are gonna be different. Um, and within the seeds, it really talks about the, the journey and the idea of the trail that people are on, but also the trail of life that we share together. So really trying to get that metaphor. Um, the one on the lower left is a bladder pod. And actually there are medallions in it that were done with a community project that I did on Zoom because of the pandemic. So there are repeated images and changes of images. They all tell you where you are here. And um, anyway, they're the kind of pieces you could look at quite a bit and, and unearth some new information. Thank you, Kim. Nada. Yeah, okay. So um, for this project, I grew um, two different types of tobacco, um, to, uh, Nicotania rustica, which is a wild tobacco, um, and Nicotania tobaccum, which is a hybrid. Um, and it, it's the tobacco that was ultimately grown in large scale and spread around the planet in various forms. So Nicotania tobacco has these incredible large leaves that inspired me to apply images directly onto the surface using a temporary tattoo process. And my idea was to suggest that the plant, which has a complex history with humans, I mean, it's an incredible history, um, has inherited its own history, which has grown out on its leaves. And I was particularly interested in um, tobacco's history during, during following the years um, between contact of, between the Americas and Europe when it was considered like a panacea for anything that was wrong with you. Um, and the images include references to historical figures that played a role in um, spreading tobacco throughout the world. Um, I'm gonna just switch over and say that the tobacco is part of a larger um, ongoing series where I grow and photograph plants that have had a significant relationship with global economies, um, challenged morality, caused violence, fueled addiction and generated legislation. And my particular focus has been mainly on plants that alter our consciousness. And I put this slide, I submitted this slide because just to give you kind of a sense of the scale, because I sort of see them as plant gods. This particular piece is of belladonna, but I've worked with coffee, coca, datura, brumanzia, cacao, San Pedro cactus, cannabis, magic mushrooms, opium, ephedra, mandrake, and, and quite a few others. So my process is to grow the plants, photograph them along the way, um, and then combine them into these sort of botanical images. And so <laughs> then switching gears, um, this Gringotopia, um, which is in the show, is a series of 12 10 minute videos that are compiled from interviews I did over a period of two years um, in 2015 and 2016, where I talked to 25 citizens from Mexico, the US and Canada, 
um, who had uh, who were living in Chapala, Mexico, which is south of Guadalajara and home to one of the largest and oldest communities of uh, U.S. citizens living outside the country. And some of the things that we talked about included uh, cultural differences between all the North American countries, motivations for leaving the U.S., fun things like who and who is not a gringo, the meaning of manana, misunderstandings in language, economic inequality, bargaining, tipping, safety, fear, crime, guns, the cartel, Mexican justice, cross-cultural romance, uh, smoking weed, the border uh, settling in, returning to the States, dying and more. I had over 40 hours of material um, and the different chapters are woven together um, with the pacing of a social conversation. And for me, it was kind of a way to address this narrative of the US being like the best country in the world to live in. Um, and then this is kind of a project that that um, is a bit, um, has been a bit um, ongoing, but stopped by the pandemic where I've been driving around the country um, for a couple of years in a row during the summer um, and um, with my friend and assistant Archer setting up in public places, asking people to send, to tell a joke. It's been, it's like I said, it's been a bit on hold and I'm, I'm not exactly what to share with them to do with the material yet, but I've collected like like I think like 350 jokes so far. So um, I'm really looking forward to getting back out. It's kind of like a small form of visual storytelling. And also um, it's just very interesting because um, I mean, I see humor as something that's very telling about the culture and being like culturally specific. Um, and um, so I'm looking forward to getting back out and, and uh, collecting a few more jokes, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I did it. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Pamela. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Pamela J. Peters. I am Danae. I was born and raised on the Navajo Reservation. I currently live here on Tavangar. I want to recognize um, the Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of this homeland called Tavangar. Um, the photo on the I guess on your left side, um, it's an image of 12 women from a poem that is actually um, at the gallery right now. And it's a poem that I wrote a couple years ago and it's called My Once Life. And it's a hybrid poem where I had 12 native women that live here in Los Angeles read um, a line from my poem. And the poem really represents the continuous continuing impact of coloniz colonization of, of Native people, but how we continue to persevere and still exist within this society today. And the photo on, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, this photo is, um, it's part of my series called Interculturality. And this woman, her name is Vicki Eagle. She is Lakota in Japanese. And this photo was taken at Union Station in Los Angeles. In, in her traditional jingle dress. And the photo um, explores the cultural dis dissonance in metropolitan cities. And I really like this photo because it does represent a lot of how we've migrated to the city through um, Indian policies and um, how we, you know, I also like the, the, the signing of information because it gives it gives context to the viewer to want to know more information of like why she's in her jingle dress and also talk about who she is and also the landscape of what Union Station represents as land in place. Um, it's a place of traveling. It's a place of movement. Um, this photo is of um, another native uh, relative that um, here in Los Angeles. Her name is Cheyenne Phoenix. She is Dene and Northern Paiute. And I did this photo um, in Sepica um, for the reason because I wanted to respond to Edward Curtis's um, representation of Native Americans through his photography work. So I wanted to kind of create and re reclaim our imagery of who we are as opposed to a a white photographer taking imagery of who we are and kind of give the sense of that we are still here in the city. So this is part of a series that I call Natives in the City. 
And I really like this because she's just standing there um, taking place in on Tong, Tongva land and people around her really don't see her. And it kind of represents of how society doesn't see us as native people as well. Um, and then this third photo, I was I took this in a uh, area in downtown Skid Row, which is actually a village that I've learned of the Tongva people called um, Yanga. And it was also a place where a lot of Native Americans lived um, after the Indian relocation program. And now it's become this alley called Indian Alley that um, showcases a lot of murals done by uh, Native Americans and also uh, non-Natives to represent the, the the culture and the existence of who we are as Native peoples. And this is a young artist who is um, from the Yemez Pueblo tribe, and this is his 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 mural that he did with um, Shepherd Ferry, and it's still down in downtown Los Angeles. And I like this because it represents everything that I'm doing with my work, which is decolonizing and I'm still remaining to keep calm in my existence of who I am as an artist. Thank you, Pamela. Mm -hmm. Hello, Linda. Hello, everyone. I want to thank Santa Ana College and Suzanne and Sandra for giving us this opportunity to share our work. My work is really about the uh, it's about urban reality, uh, US Latinos in the United States. These particular pieces are data pictographs. And I basically draw an image on a piece of brown paper. I count the number of spaces in that piece. And then I paint the appropriate number of spaces, brown, different shades of brown, to signify data. In the top piece, there's 116 drawn spaces times 63% equals 73 painted brown spaces signifying the fact that 30% of US population will be Latino in 2050. The bottom is 116 drawn spaces times 63% equals 73 painted brown spaces, signifying the data that 63% of US labor trafficking is Latino. This piece here is also a data piece. I've now begun making um, sculptural data works rather than just painted flat pieces. There's a tattoo on the back of this Grecian goddess who is also painted brown. I, uh, for the last uh, 15 years or so, I've been painting, buying uh, figurines from antique malls and painting their skin brown to turn politics of power, a class and color on its head. In this particular piece, there's 31 spaces times 40.6% is 13 painted spaces on her back signifying the fact that in 2010 and 2015, Latino college graduates grew by 40.6%. I'd like to share another piece of data as we're looking at this one, that for the first time in history this year, 36% of UC entrants are Latino for the first time in history. So uh, Latinos are a part of the uh, US culture. We've been here for a very long time, a part of the land, a part of the environment, if you will. And we've made a very big impact and we're going to be making bigger impacts now because we are the median age of Latinos is only 28. This is an interesting small piece. It's called a diorama. It's also a data piece. It's going to be a part of my solo at the um, Museum of Latin American Art next year in 2022. This is, uh, this is uh, there's a painting on the wall of this little diorama that is also a Dato Sagrados. It has 72 spaces times 96% equals 69 brown painted areas in that little painting on the wall, signifying the fact that 96% of US Latinos believe the US is the best place in the world. Now I've given them the American dream. So I've given those Latinos the American dream that they're looking for with all the postmodern furniture, a guitar, a sound system. And I've left them the white gods because they really do like their white gods. And you can see the white gods there on the wall. The brown dots are really a part of a very much larger portfolio of work that I've been working on for a very long time called the Brown Dot Project, which also uses brown dots to signify data on in two dimension as well as three dimension. I've completed a series of these dioramas. One of them is also a Victorian bathroom, which is pretty funny. This particular piece is called Milk Chocolate Clock and Candelabra Ensemble. 
It is a, a remake of a Victorian object. Uh, these particular pieces painted milk chocolate brown really talk about uh, opulence, politics of power, the history of the United States and corporate America beginning in about 1850 to the turn of the century. I've been doing a great deal of study and research in this particular area. Guided by the question, where were Latinos at, in the making of the United States? Where were we? Where were the Cubanos, the Puerto Ricanos, the Mexicanos? 66% of all Latinos in the United States are Mexican, which is very interesting where I am myself a Mexican American. This will also be a part of my solo exhibition at the museum and it'll be surrounded by a series of Victorian objects, all painted milk chocolate. People ask me why milk chocolate? It seems to be the least egregious color to everyone who sees them of all races, colors, creeds, and orientations. Milk chocolate is sweet, it is delectable, like being brown. Thank you, Linda. Gail. Okay. My work begins with the land. Specifically, I'm inspired by the color, the light, flora, and fauna of the Southern California desert and mountain landscapes. I regularly visit our old village site called Coupa, located in North San Diego County. And I also spend a lot of time exploring the Anza Borrego State Park, which was once home to the Cupeño, Kumeyaay, and Cahuilla people. There are traces of their presence throughout the park, including village sites, rock art paintings called pictographs, and mortreros, the huge rocks that, with holes deeply carved by hundreds of years of women grinding acorns. The plants and animals that inspire me even the rocks are our relatives. In creation stories and other stories and songs, they are the people. In the Cupeño creation story, there is a part where the creator has died and has been burned, but the heart remains and is being protected by the trees from the trickster coyote. An excerpt reads, these first people, we're doing something. All these live oaks, pines, willows, black oaks with meat like butter, they were all standing. They made a circle and these blue oaks who are like black oaks, only smaller, those stood first. And these other people stood behind them and they were spreading out their hands to guard. In my work, I try to capture the spirit of a plant or perhaps a bird. I want a plant to be seen as more than just a plant. I'm trying to capture a world coming into being or evolving. To capture this feeling, I might draw some of the images and then some of the images are more fully rendered. I often use birds in my work. Birds are full of poetic meaning, and that meaning can be open to interpretation. For me, I'm thinking about our traditional bird song, songs called bird songs. These songs are usually sung by the men and boys using gourd rattles, and the women dance the bird dance. They are joyful social songs. From what I understand, the songs, bird songs tell about the journey of the people which is said to parallel the migration of the birds. Some tell about what the birds or people see on their journey. In my mind, they see the mountains, deserts, night sky, and other landmarks. Rather than illustrating a particular song or story, I try to invoke a sense of journey. I often include Southern California Indian basket designs in my work, we are known for our beautiful, intricately woven baskets that often use floral and geometric designs. My great-grandmother, Salvadora Valenzuela, was a noted basket maker. At times, I include rock art designs common to this area, such as dot patterns, chevrons, diamond patterns, spirals, concentric circles, and mazes. The Southern California landscape, our stories and songs and other cultural imagery all merge together for me to create a sense of 
place. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. I'm sorry that I couldn't get rid of that bar on the side. It, I just decided to leave it there rather than you see my little poker moving around. But I really appreciate everybody's uh, comments. And um, I didn't say at the beginning, and I'll say it now, we're going to have some questions that the panel will answer. If you have questions for the panel or comments you wanted to make, please put them in the chat box. And one of us will be monitoring the chat box. After the panelists have had a chance to you know, go on for about 20, 25 minutes, then we will go to the chat box and pull out questions that are in there. OK? Just so everybody is on the same page and you know what's happening. Um, all righty. Uh, We've kind of gone over these questions with the artists ahead of time. Uh, the, the order of them has gotten shifted around, but I don't think that'll matter. Uh, if this is a conversation. I'm not gonna call an individual artist to answer any question. Basically, I'll put the question out there and any panelist that wants to answer it can raise their hand. Then if there is something that is said in that whatever, and somebody else in the panel wants to talk to it, they can raise their hand and it'll be a conversation, kind of like you have in a classroom because we got to raise our hands. Uh, to begin it, I just want to read one quote. And this is something that comes to me from uh, the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer, Kimmerer. Um, and I thought it really fit what we're trying to do with this exhibition and this conversation. Stories are among our most potent tools for restoring the land, as well as our relationship to the land. We need to unearth the old stories that live in a place and be, that live in a place and begin to create new ones. For we are story makers, not just storytellers. All stories are connected, new ones woven from the threads of old. That author is both a mother, a scientist, and a decorated professor of environmental biology. She's also an enrolled member of the Potawatomi Nation and the founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. And seeing that we're talking about telling tales and tales of the land and tales of our lives, that's kind of what we're doing. We're asking each other to think about our personal experiences and uh, how that reflects on the land with this exhibition. So the first question that I have for you is to talk about, it's not really a question, I guess, talk about the kinds of origin or source materials you use in your art to tell your stories. What do you consider that the art makes possible in telling your story? Okay, hi Kim. You're muted. Thank you. Um, I think for me, what I um, what crossed my mind about that question was um, some of you know I worked for six months with incarcerated women who do firefighting. Um, and they've been in the news a lot and a lot of articles and now some books out about them and so on. Um, and I, I think that interviews, uh, Nada does interviewing with people also as videos. I do interviews really to um, get raw material, I guess I would call it, to then create sculpture or installations primarily. So I always feel really blessed that I get to be in these situations to meet people that under normal circumstances, I would never have the privilege to meet. And when I went up to Camp 13 for all those months um, to be able to hear the women talk about their experiences firefighting and also about their experiences, how they got incarcerated in the first place and what that means to their life and their families and their future, um, that really changes everything for me and again, I don't think normally people get to meet people out of their little bubble of what their lives are. And I think artists are always very lucky to be able to kind of shift through all these different strata of what um, 
life presents for us because I learned much more from those women than they learned from me. I will say that again and again. I really did. Super. Thank you. Yes, Linda. Um, my source material comes from um, um, diametrically opposed places, it seems. Um, I enjoy uh, uh, reading um, the plays of great American playwrights as an example and their biographies, which is completely alternate to the object that I produce, but I find that oddly placed source material sometimes brings in uh, odd ideas that then can become object if you uh, meditate on them and maybe do some experimentation to be able to integrate them into an object. For the last uh, several years, I've been reading uh, biographies of writers and their plays and other uh, books and then watching the movies made from these objects as well to find out what actually happens with production and how artists work is uh, changed by the media, by media. I also spend a great deal of time in um, antique malls looking for an, uh, Victorian antiques for the last two years. That's what I've been doing is studying antiques. And I even have opened up a small antique store on an online store called Cherish where I sell some of the items that I've found. I've become pretty knowledgeable about uh, American made Victorian antiques of uh, the manufacturers and the products that were made. And I'm becoming pretty uh, uh, knowledgeable about uh, Victorian culture and what was considered beautiful in Victorian age uh, from the uh, European point of view and the new American point of view. Um, I also collect a great deal of data and I'm constantly downloading data and reading data and uh, difficult sets. I have to aggregate data myself. So um, my practice is really uh, one where I look at disparate types of source materials. And um, I find that if I, if I just follow an interest that I have and maybe make a dedication to study source material from different places that I can come up with imagery that is, um, is new. It has a different flair to it, a different final result to it, a different meaning to it. And I take a good deal of pleasure in that, but I have to say that um, sometimes the art, the actual image and the, the source material never meet. They never actually meet. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they meet sort of in a sort of a flash and a whole, a whole portfolio of work will come from it. Um, and I never know, I just kind of follow what's of interest to me. Um, but I really find that that's, uh, I think that's pretty part of the, for the course for an artistic mind and how artistic minds function by collecting thoughts, ideas, feelings, information from multiple locations, and then weaving them together to create object with statement. Mm. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Gail. Okay. Well, for me, I, I think I already mentioned, I do spend a lot of time out in the Ansborego State Park area. So I, I, for me, source material is just, is being out there, being out on the, the land and hiking. I do a great deal of, of that. And for me, it's always an amazing experience, particularly to think that I'm walking where my ancestors walked and see what they saw. Uh, you know, for, for thousands of years. And also, I, I'm also do a lot of reading. You mentioned Braiding Sweetgrass, which is one of a favorite book of mine. I haven't gotten through all of it yet, but I'm working my way. Another really great one for me was The Sweet Breathing of Plants that was edited by Linda Hogan. And Oh, there's so many books, <laughs> but I also look at things like the plant manuals, you know, that have drawings of the plants and the dissections and all that. I find a lot of inspiration from that. Um, 
There's another great book called Surviving Through the Days. It's a... When you go out on the land, yep. Gail, mm -hmm. do, you, do you draw on, you know, from the plants? Do you... Uh, uh, I take, yeah, I take a lot of photographs. My husband does too. So we, you know, are both doing that. But I, I like to more or less just experience it and bring it back with me and also later reference photographs that I, we've taken. So is, was that what you were gonna ask? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't usually draw when I'm out there. Okay. Yeah. Maida. Um, well, I, you know, I guess you never, am I, am I on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess you never really know. I mean, I never know where source material may come from. So I have like a, as a photographer, I have like an enormous library of things that I've collected along the way. So when I do like the big botanical images, I can look back and I've got like cocoons and insects and birds and all of those kinds of things that I just do like along the way. And then in terms of like, um, like video work, which I'm very interested in now, it's just, um, I live in Huntington Beach and it's, um, <clears throat> I live by the pier where there's a lot of uh, dialogue going on. So I've been doing a lot of video, video recording down there. Um, um, and I find I'm interested, I love to do interviews with people and I'm interested in just this whole idea of talking to strangers um, because you don't, there's a certain, um, you just don't know where it's going to go, actually, and it's being really open while you're talking to people. And also there's a certain responsibility because anybody, any one of us that talks for too long, maybe not all of you, but I certainly know for myself, you'll start to say things that like are unintelligent or kind of like incoherent. And so when I'm editing, I feel a real responsibility to really listen to people um, and eliminate the things that I know that they may not mean, you know, even though it might be like a, some great line or something or really funny, or I, you know, there's a certain, like I try to bring a certain empathy to it. Um, so I don't want to take any like cheap shots when I edit with people. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I know, I know that for Gringotopia, I had collected, I went back there twice, like the first time. And the first time I went back, I had envisioned the piece as being like a, um, a like a one hour just immersion piece where you might see it in a gallery but I was just convinced that maybe no one would ever see it if I had to sort of just run around and try to present it to galleries so that's that ultimately made me break it into these these pieces of these 12 chapters but originally when I went back I had this hour long this, this was my first experience doing this I had this hour long piece that I put together with all of them and I felt I went back and I felt like I know all of you so well because I have just listened to you for like you know like a hundred like 200 hours or whatever and like I like they didn't really hardly remember me and they were like super nervous about like what did I say you know so I was like so nervous about showing them this piece and and nervous about how they would how they felt like they would be represented and to my surprise and my great relief um you know they loved it and they felt well represented and so it gave me the courage to actually continue to interview people while I was down there and then complete the project um, uh, maybe that's not really an answer to your question but um well it is in a way because what I'm also asking is you know we, we go to these source materials and then somehow we turn it into art. And it's almost like the art leads us to the image or it leads us to the modality that we're gonna use. It leads us. And, but at some point we've also gathered other things in that we wanna put into it. So who's leading who and, you know, and how do you come to that balance of, um, okay, uh, I think I know what I want to do, but look what it's doing over here. Maybe that's even better, you know, and how do you come to that for your own work? Well, and that's kind of maybe a little bit of what Linda was saying too, that, you know, I mean, you just, you don't, you don't know, there's the inspiration and maybe collecting, but then somehow you end up with art, but it may not, it may not be connected with the original thing. I mean, that's the whole process of of I guess creativity and I mean if I feel like I'm working on something and I already know what it's going to be I'm already bored I mean I I don't 
I think I don't want to do it because then I, there's no sense of discovery while you're making it. And, um, and I have made pieces like that where like, I already know what it's going to be and like, I'll finish it. And, you know, and then those are like not inspired pieces actually. And then there's always those pieces like that, where like you make them and they're like in between bodies of work and you make the piece and like, you don't know what it means and you sit on it and it just kind of sits there. I mean, I've said this before. It's like, I wish someone would do a show of all those pieces that are the in between pieces between like one body of work and another because those are these insecure pieces and sometimes they're like really 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 like on target and then you go like yeah that's it I'm gonna go in that direction and I those are I love those pieces <laughs> um they're scary but um yeah but uh yeah good yeah Kim It's so funny you say that because I went to go visit St. Calsa out in Joshua Tree last week uh, when I was doing a different project. And um, we were both talking about, I, I didn't even think of them as between pieces, but just, these, but I guess they are. They're these odd one-offs that come out that aren't attached to like a big blown project you know both of us do as all the people here like these long-term projects that are very intense to kind of keep your energy up and keep your vision clear you know like where am I now in this big project where these little pieces we all have them and Sant was like somebody should do a big show of that like just like three from each artist like what's this oddball piece that, you know, they're usually kind of small and they, they, well, like you said, Nate, they're just really peculiar anomalies, like within the mm -hmm. um, more intellectualized way we present ourselves in the art world. And I, I just will add, cause I'm on, on mute. <laughs> I want to add one more thing. Sure. This idea of not knowing we're going to end up with a piece because you know the focus on process and letting the materials and the people and the you know research and and the experience like kind of guide where that piece is going to conclude i i mean that's totally the way i love to work and i just want to add that that's what makes everybody so nervous it's it you know like if you're doing a public art piece or a big show coming up and you're like, well, I'm not sure what this is going to turn out. Like, you know, I don't know where I'm going with this. You know, it, I think that's a real dilemma for most artists that that kind of conflict between wanting to retain one's purity of adventure and, and this kind of um, pressure to maybe produce a series or, you know, or the show's got was supposed to be like this. Now it looks like this. Um, I, I think that's a lot of undue pressure that's placed on us all the time. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question. For some of you, the idea that your work is tied to the environment is no big deal. But in this exhibition, some of you are more accustomed to dealing with issues that deal with politics or deal with identity or something like that. And here we've plunked you into an exhibition that's dealing with environmental issues as a subtext. How did that feel? Anybody have feelings about that? Da, 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 da. Oh, come on, Gail, you gave me hell. No? Okay, Linda. I'd like to turn the question back to you. Oh. Why, why, did, you, why did you include people who are basically socio-political in an environmental exhibit? What was your reasoning and rationale? Okay, uh, my rationale is that you can't separate the land and what we've done to it from what we've done to each other. That we tend, that humans treat the earth as the same way that we treat one another. And it's obvious when you look at the way we abuse it, um, take advantage of it, exploit it, et cetera. And only in, and to make that reality real, you really have to look at our stories. That was my rationale. How about you, Sandra? 
Um, I think I was compelled by the, the individual viewpoints. Um, in fact, when we started, um, I remember talking with, you know, with Phil and Tim, and they'd had quite a few strictly environmental shows at the, at the college. And so this seemed an opportunity to bring an array of different perspectives and really, um, you know, in some, it's sort of like, you know, it's like in a painting, the environment is foreground and, and, and primary and in others, it's, it's sort of an assumption. Um, and, you know, that, that we all, to me, I was drawn, perhaps it was, we struggled a bit with the title here, but we really loved Stories of the Land, but part of it is a sense of place. And I think we all have a sense of place, whether it's metaphoric, whether it's in a culture, whether it's a place of origin. And I know in this, at some point, I, I'm hoping Pamela will speak because she has a really wonderful way of, of you know, she's literally addressing when it, it seemed my impression with is is an inversion of the assumptions um that are made uh, of of indigenous uh history and and what the culture has done and so this is a, a wonderful i mean we're kind of just looking at it you know we have i mean it's great you know um huntington beach you know what could be more precise then, you know, it's in the news this week, you know, it's been in the news for COVID protests, it's been in the news now for the oil spill. Um, and, and that, and that's where night is, I mean, the, it, it finds its way. And, and it has a way of, of location. So it's a matrix that allows an avenue. And I think if you ask people to relate to stories, um, there's this wonderful prompt Suvan, you put in the gallery that actually for visitors and what is the storyline on that? I was trying to remember that this morning. I basically just asked people to write the, about where they were born, lived or st are living and tell us a little story about it. And what's fascinating, I was looking at that wall over the weekend because people just write and then pin it to the wall. and. It's astounding how many people have come from other places and what they've left behind to come here or what they've encountered since they've been here. And it's, it's from all over the world. We are a, a mobile people uh, anymore. You know, we're not people who've been raised in one place and have been there for generations anymore. Uh, I thought I saw a hand. Was that you, Phil? Yes, it was. Thank you. Um, I, I don't mean to hijack the conversation at all, but um, some of you may or may not know, besides being the gallery director, I my background is photography. And the type of photography that I do deals with human presence in the environment. Like, is it a, is it a sim symbiotic relationship? And of course, the answer is no. But I go out and I, you know, basically, you know, my elevator pitch to people that just kind of think, oh, you're a photographer, I'd say, I go out into the beautiful wilderness, hunt down, you know, trash, take pictures of trash in a beautiful environment. And that's my, that's my work. And so I, I work very hard and I'm not successful at it. Um, I work very hard at trying to not be so biased in the way the, the, the themes of my shows. So it's, it, it tends to really always be very, Centered, it's very much centered around the earth. And um, so when, when Sandra and Suvan uh, met with me, we were able to, you know, just have more meat and potatoes to this show than just simply us pillaging the land, if you will, which is, again, that's my automatic go-to. So it's, it's nice that I'm able to up the game, if you will, intellectually with, with the, uh, the exhibition that we've got in there right now. So Again, thank you very much for all of you uh, participating. I'm honored. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Nada, you got your hand up. I do. I just saw the hand thing. Um, yeah, I, I mean, your qu original question was, how does it feel? And I mean, there's so many exhibitions that are about like aesthetics or, I mean, that I'm thrilled to be in an exhibition because th this is the dialogue taking place. I mean, all the things that you're talking about. And so in terms of, 
being in an exhibition and how it feels. I, I think it's, you know, any exhibition that, that makes people talk about things other than just pure aesthetics, which I guess are important too. Um, I think is important and relevant and interesting and educational and, and valid and, and needs, need, needs to be done. So that's my, my two cents. <laughs> Sandra, you had a couple of questions for people. Sure. Um, well, one is was um, suggested by one of our, our artist panelists, and I. It's something that taps into. I think a lot of us are searching for it right now, and it's the state of, of the environment, or the, whether it's the political environment or the physical environment, um, can be fairly challenging, <laughs> um, overwhelming. Um, and when you're doing your work, are you surprised or do you find inside yourself either resilience or uh, an experience of hope that even when you're, if you're chronicling the trash, if you're Phil and cr chronicling the trash, and I know I do a fair bit of that myself, um, the, just the action, you know, where the, 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 the other, not quite the silver lining that that's make it, that makes it too simple, but the, the sense of hope and resilience that you see in your own work or you've seen in, in others work. I mean, it could be, you know, surprises that, that you find in, and perhaps not your own experience of making, but perhaps your experience of, of, of viewing. Um, I can start with that. <laughs> Great. <Okay>. Welcome. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do. And I feel like sometimes when I do my work, it has like one, one focal point. And then when it expands to larger subject matters, it really like, it blows my mind. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, I didn't really realize that this, this image or this project would expand to different avenues for for instance when i had started my project to talk about the beginning point for for me because there's many stories of native americans migration but for me it was about the migration of american indians coming to los angeles but initially i wanted to change the vision of how people view Native Americans in a contemporary context as opposed to what people have always seen us as relic of the past. But I needed a starting point and I needed to bring in how that happened through our migration to urban establishments like Los Angeles. But then there was a political reason behind that. It was about the relationship with the United States government. But then it expanded to the history of Los Angeles about what I was capturing in my image is about another decade of um, gentrification that was happening in Los Angeles and how I was able to capture these images in, a, in, in this series 10 years ago. And Ch Los Angeles has changed tremendously. And some of those places, those landmarks are gone. So it talked about the history, it talked about the political relationships we have with the United States government. It talks about the imagery of who we are as American Indians. Then it, it expanded into the location of Bunker Hill. And then it, 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 it grew into me understanding that it was also a village that um, the Tongva people had that they named Yanga. So it just continued to grow and grow and grow. And I'm just like fascinated because I'm like, I just wanted to take these beautiful images. <laughs> too. But I think that's the resilience in what I do with my work. And I'm learning more, even with the couple of images that I have in your show and about the the poetry and how it encapsulates the whole aspect of who we are, but it also remembers who we are as a resilient people today. Nice. Wonderful. Anyone else? Sivana, how would you answer that? Resilience? Yeah, for you and your work, because you, oh. you, you work. Well, you know, it's not the art that makes me 
feel like uh, it's not the art that makes me feel resilient. Um, art for me is a way of thinking. And um, I always struggle to capture what it is I'm thinking about and find some way to share that with people. Um, so my sense of resilience actually comes from the natural world. I'm, you know, I'm the kind of person who sees a weed coming up, you know, cracking the sidewalk and a weed coming up going, go baby, go. <laughs> um, and it's, we're at this really incredible moment. I mean, we're, we're busting out all over. Yeah, the, um, the environmental challenges are huge, but the pushback now is huge and it's global and it has to be. And I'm really glad about that. That makes me, that's where, you know, I get my sense of buoyancy and that progress is being made and why I want to do exhibitions like this so I could, we can have conversations like this so I can say, hope is not lost. We're actually doing what needs to be done. You know, there wasn't that long ago that nobody had heard of civil rights or human rights not that long ago. You know, people have been around a long time, but we're now getting clued to the fact that human beings really need to be treated well, everybody. Oh, and oh my gosh, we might need to treat the environment well because our, you know, continuance depends on its continuance. And oh my God, it's a web, it's interlocked. Native people knew this, they depended on the land, you know? We've forgotten that because we went off and we did the mechanical, you know, factory thing. But uh, I find art is a way we can say all of that. That's what I love about art. You know, there's no one way to do it. I love that. Linda. Well, um, you know, you can't really bottle resilience. No. Uh, you certainly can't bottle hope. Uh, you can't buy resilience, you can't buy hope. Uh, an artist that is resilient is probably someone who will last into their later years and still produce. Resilience is something that you hope that you, well, they're, they're together there. It's something that you hope that you have. Um, resilience is a, is a gift. It's not always present. I think any one of us that are, you know, over 20 have gone through enough to realize that sometimes resilience will come to your aid and sometimes it's slow in coming to your aid. And that's just a part of maturity and growing and learning and continuing to produce. Uh, resilience is a, the ability to see the new image for me. That's where resilience lies for me, is in the ability to envision and actually produce the new image, the new statement, uh, the, new, the new idea, uh, the, the, the desire to uh, recreate myself over and over and over and over and over and over again as an artist, hopefully as a human being, as a woman, as a mother, as a grandmother. But, uh, you know, something that I search for all the time, something that I hope for all the time. And I consider resilience to me is, is a lot of hard work. It's not like a little hat that you put on or a little dress that you put on or a button that you wear. It's, uh, you know, it's, you, you really have to work hard for it. Um, I can see our gallery director nodding his head as well because he's probably been through a lot himself and resilience takes a lot to show enthusiasm for new opportunities as a form of resilience even after you've been through the mill you know you've been through the ringer and now you've been given what could be a new opportunity and you have to build enthusiasm which is a part of resilience you know you can tell i'm pretty tired <laughs> and i've had a muster of resilience for the last, I don't know how many, I hate to say decades of my life, it's tough. And uh, sometimes my art provides it, sometimes the land provides it for me. Some, a lot of times my family provides it for me. Sometimes it's just the quiet, just some quiet provides it for me. A study, a lot of times provides it for me, reading and study. Yeah, resilience. 
Gail, you had your hand up earlier. Well, I, I just wanted to comment, not on my own work really, but on, um, I don't know if Pamela is still there, but I, I was really moved by her poem, My Once Life. And when I, I'm glad she spoke to hope, hope resilience because I had her in mind kind of when I came up with that question, but, but I just felt like that the women that were are reading the lines there it's it's there are a lot of hard truths but i thought just them reading it itself was a statement about resilience and hope and i i can't remember the last words the last lines of the poem i don't know if she's still there if she could say but i that i think that it ends with that so i was just that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Great. And you are the author of that question. <laughs> Thank you for submitting it. <laughs> really appreciate that. I think I think that there's a part with resilience. To me, it's that, you know, the people, it actually goes together with the hardship or those who have been either ignored or not, not benefited from, the structural rewards of art or, you know, how life has dealt cards, whether, and whether particularly it's been based on some unfavorable, you know, some nothing to do with someone personally, but, but the capacity to get up each day and, and make your way at least enough that you and your family and hopefully your art, if you're an artist or whatever your, your place on our, in our world is, that you know about something that people who have been inside the system and well rewarded don't. And that's what we're, that's why it's so important that more voices are speaking now because they literally know something that our environment needs, both socially, politically, naturally, that um, if you sat in a more um, traditional place of, a privilege, um, you don't have that, that same information. It is to be, it, it is really, um, you haven't, it, it's not in your bones quite the same way, but everyone now is waking up to the fact that we are in this together, no matter where we may have been sitting. Someone may have been thinking it's great. They're on top of a hill and they have a great view of the ocean, but they are still, we're still in the same, the same firma. It's, um, and, and our capacity to, to, you know, if we don't have quality air, it doesn't quality water, um, you know, we're, we're equally impacted, but there is something really wonderful that happens. And, and unfortunately, you know, some category, you know, women artists in particular, you know, this is sponsored by the Women's Caucus for Art. And, you know, it's coming up on our 50th anniversary and, you know, it's, um, I mean, it's one of those, just like Kathy Seltzer has been on the call with the Window Between Worlds, so many play, people that have founded things and they would ask me, what do you think would be best? And what would be your hope for us in, in 20 years? And I go that you're not here and not needed. <laughs> the work has been done. <laughs> we, Actually, that kind of goes to the last question that we sort of put together from what Kim and Linda were asking, which, you know, is there uh, a long-term artistic goal, uh, career goal, and um, and are there strategies we use to achieve those uh, um, those goals? Do you know? Would people like to share what their long-term goals are? Given the state of the world, I mean, it might be changing for you. I don't know. I'm just asking. Kim. And you're muted. Um, you know, I'm going to answer this sort of based on the last question as well as this question. Um, I start really um, seeing the intense value of one on one um, interactions with people that the art provides. Um, and also related to that in some way that. Um, I, I finally realize how even when it seems like I'm doing 
like say a solo show or solo what seems like a solo project it is always based on collaborations with lots of people and lots of people doing all sorts of aspects to pull the whole together and that to me like see that's where i get resilience by sort of understanding that um part of that came up today because i've been working the last couple of weeks with the noah purifoyan um some of you may know that outdoor museum in joshua tree and they pulled me in on projects before i'm an old friend of his when he was alive i knew him for many decades and um today i was at horace mann middle school and i don't know if any of you have ever done projects with middle schoolers but it's really challenging okay <laughs> it's like you're looking for energy just like walk in the room it do nothing <laughs> and um you know what happened was i there were like maybe a handful of those kids of the 25 kids that because we were making handmade paper there's a lot of interaction I saw what they, who they were. A couple of them were born leaders. You would never have interacted with them without seeing their future because of just the way they were helping other kids and the way they were so curious about stuff. And I just, I find that if I want to like think about the future, it's those kind of roles that artists play that really moved me to want to make my own personal work better, to make projects that engage lots of people, like really an understanding that art isn't just like small things put on somebody's wall later. They're really about um, making space for experiences for people. And it, it's not neat and tidy. I mean, we were in the wind. I don't know if you guys saw what the weather was like today, but we were making hammy paper out in the wind with everything oh, wow. flying everywhere. But everybody was into it, you know? So anyway, I, I, that just moved me and will, I, that will sustain me for many weeks to come. Great. Thank you. You know, um, if anyone has questions that they'd like the um, panel to address, maybe while we hear from someone else, let's start putting some in the chat because they haven't come forward. And I will just say, this is one time, I love the webinar so that we're, we can see one another, but I so miss seeing everyone that's here because many of you are friends and it feels really strange <laughs> to see your name and not your face. <laughs> Anyone else want to answer the career kind of long-term goals? Linda, I think it was your question. You're muted. I just, um, um, women artists in the larger scheme of things, um, nationally and internationally, uh, there's a, there's a, there is a glass ceiling and it's a, it can be rather difficult for women artists on different fronts in terms of getting um, uh, assistance to produce work, especially large. I'm sure Kim knows all about these kinds of challenges. And I find that it's, for, the reason why I pose this question is that I believe that it's very important for artists, especially women artists in this, around this particular topic in today's event, that we make a specific career goal so that we have a somewhat of a roadmap that'll help us get to the next level of production and of sharing work with audiences. Um, producing art, of course, is central to everything. It's, it's at the center of the being, but there must be outreach and opportunities to be able to share the work with audiences and to have encounters like the fun one that Kim was just talking about a couple of seconds ago. I find a great deal of joy in having panels of at my exhibitions where I actually get to hear the thoughts of viewers and feelings and thoughts of viewers. I find that to be very um, important for me. But the reason why I posed this question now was because I just wanted to draw a point on the idea that we all need to set goals for ourselves in terms of what we hope for our careers for the future, because that's one of the ways that we'll be able to accomplish more in terms of sharing our work with larger audiences and diverse audiences. 
Cool. Anyone else? And you can ask each other questions too. Yeah. If you have something that you would love to know of one another, then go for it. <laughs> um, I'd also, it's in the poem right now. Let me, I mean, let me make sure it goes out to everyone. Um, Pamela Peters, I think you'll really want to go hear this. Um, I'll put it out to everyone. Her video poem is just outstanding. Um, and um, I'm thank you, Pamela, for posting that. So if you don't have a question to ask one another, I've got one more. But if you do, I'm happy to sit on it. <laughs> My question is, what does it mean to you to make your art? You know, I'm, all my art is about time. It's about the experience of time. So I'm really curious what it means to you to be working, doing the kind of work you're doing at this moment in time, in this place, whether it's this city, this nation, this, you know, <laughs> this planet. Um, what does it mean to you to be doing that now? Linda. Okay. Um, for the last uh, 40 plus years, I've been spending a great deal of time in Chicano, Latino, and indigenous communities. And I've collected a lot of experiences and a lot of, um, I've, I've, I've studied a lot. I have a lot of feelings and a lot of information that I've gathered um, over 40 years. You just tend to gather a lot of stuff. It's like a lot of source material, like we were talking earlier. I have a, a mountain of source material. I don't think I could climb it. And uh, one day, um, you know, Make Them All Mexican hit me like a ton of bricks. I walked into a uh, antique mall and I found a pilgrims, little, little, little pilgrim salt and pepper shakers. And I just uh, yelled an explicative and said, I could paint them brown. Who invited who to dinner anyway? Yeah, who invited who to dinner anyhow? And uh, this, this, this whole last, since 2010, all this work has just been pouring out of me. I can't seem to stop it. And I think it's because of what I call, what I've coined as my brown intellectual property. I have collected so much of this source material from this one place in experience that eventually it just kind of comes up to your neck and sort of just comes out your eyes or comes out your ears. It just comes out of you. If you, if you study hard enough in any area, all of a sudden the objects will begin just pouring out of you. So these particular works that I've been doing are just, they sort of, they started coming out and they're just not quitting. Apparently I have a lot of brown in me that I wanna talk about that talks on its own that I don't even have that much control over sometimes. So. The work that I'm making right now is sort of a, a culmination of my own life, culmination of my own studies and experience, a culmination of myself in terms of my heritage and where I come from and my interest in that. But I think it's, it, it isn't something that I've chosen. I've said that many times. It basically chose me. Hmm. That's beautiful. Wonderful. Anyone else? Well, we may have what, come to what, the end of our. What? Okay. No, I just so like. What was the question again? Like, what does it mean to? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, I mean, this is kind of. I think this is a very pregnant time to be making art. I really do. And, you know, Linda basically said, you know, she'd been building up to it and it hit her over the head one day when she was doing, you know, researching her materials. And this is an incredible moment. There's a lot going on and we're making art in it, you know, at this time. I don't know that we're leading. I don't know that we're following. I don't know where we are in this whole maelstrom that's going on but we're making art now. Does that mean anything special to you? It does to me. 
Well, it's it's a very unusual time. I mean, I know I've reevaluated over and over again my work in the context of what's going on in the world and and who are your who is your audience, you know? I mean, if your work is always in a gallery, that's awesome, but you know, is you, you know, it's sort of most people that go to galleries are pretty much in agreement with, you know, the I think, you know, the, with ideas about the environment or, um, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess for myself, I question a lot of how do I get my, how do I create a dialogue with people with a greater world versus say just the art world. I think that that's why I've turned more to like video and film lately within, I think since the whole Trump thing happened, you know, and it feels, I feel very nervous about what's happening now politically in the country. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's nice to hear that people are optimistic, but like 50% of the country probably doesn't feel the way most of the people on this panel feel. And, you know, I think that that's pretty frightening. And the idea that we're all getting our news from different places and, you know, all the conspiracy theories and that stuff's not going away. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, Biden's po uh, polling ratings are down. And I mean, it's, um, you know, I'm pretty nervous about what's going to happen in 2022, the whole thing that happened with abortion in Texas. I mean, it's just a never ending, it's just a never ending stream of the infrastructure. I mean, all the things that, I mean, yeah, all the things that aren't getting approved right now. And, and I mean, I, I feel actually pretty frightened. So for me, I mean, I guess I felt the need to try to make work that, um, is reaching out um, in a different way. In, in I guess at the same time that I, I still love studio work and making the work that I do that has nothing to do with like politics or the situation that we're in now, but I have felt um, an urgency, I guess, about having a greater voice. Um, and I worked for, you know, local government for a number of years. So I've spent a lot of my time talking to like the other 50% of people. Um, so um, um, yeah. And then I, I've been doing a lot of video down at the pier too, because like what Sandra said, I mean, Huntington Beach has been this, there's this, there, my, my job used to be working as the events director for this particular city. I had another job too, which I won't talk about, but that, um, that put me out in public like all the time um, with people. So there's this plaza by the pier where I worked a lot and it's been like 10 years since I had that job, but I've been interviewing, like there, there's all these like uh, street preachers down there. There's like uh, street performers down there. There's people doing demonstrations and arguing down there. There's, you know, so I've been doing like, there's a lot of protests down there. Um, there was the whole Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter kind of thing that happened here. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that. I'm not sure what to do with that all, but I'm doing, it's like source material, like collecting a lot. So I guess in, in summary, I felt a great urgency to try to think about a way to be part of the dialogue with what's going on right now. Um, great. We did get one question submitted by Kathy Saltzer for Kim. Kim, have you had a chance to see it or I'll read it. Um, it says, um, Kim, I love what you said about art, not being about things to hang on people's walls, but about creating experiences that sustain and change us. I wonder your piece when you took all the waste from one month, I think this is the Science Center trash van. Um, <laughs> uh, from one month and made an artwork out of, out of it. Have you thought of offering that as um, an, ex an experience that others could be invited to participate in? It seems yeah. so potentially transformative. Oh, I'd I love to imagine a lot of us trying that and being changed by the experience. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I actually, I don't know if Kathy's talking about for persons that I've made like ones at the science center in their permanent collection. And I've, I did them. Well, I've done them at a couple schools where, you know, I get permission to dumpster dive for a certain amount of time in the school and all the parents see me pop up in the dumpster in the morning, like, well, well I put all their kids trash. And then 
make things and represent it in their galleries, right? But you know, lately I I finally finally finished a piece I worked on way too long where I had an opportunity, and maybe this is I'm not sure if this is what Kathy was talking about. Um, I was alone at a residency, so I knew all my trash for a month, the only mine, nobody else's, like, because I live with extended family and stuff, and um, I made a hope chest out of it, and it's pretty complicated, and every little itty bit of it got dealt with, I mean, I mean, you can fold some stuff, then you get to like, what am I going to do with this Perrier bottle, you know, and um, so to me, it was really an exercise. And if I have to caretake all my personal trash, what exactly, you know, here's what it takes to get rid of it, right? Something like that. So part of the project, and maybe this will um, answer Kathy's question, is that when I, in that bag of trash, I ended up with just my scraps of food right that's that's you you do something with all the plastic all the paper all the metal and then you got a bag of food left and um that's when i started doing vermiculture you know with red wiggler worms so at that nomad show that was down in santa anna is that where that was torrance, torrance. um ken's helping me um anyway i gave out worms to people so that they would start composting. So for me, maybe that will answer Kathy's question that I'm really on this like mission to get everybody to compost. And not that other people aren't trying to get people to compost. It's not like that, but as an artist, there's a certain strategy that I can use. And I'm, a, I'm pretty good at being a PT Barnum, you know, get them in the tent and like, here's your bag of worms. Here's how you do it. And um, did, I guess that answer to it. <laughs> I know everybody's laughing. I see all your, fa <laughs> your faces laughing. If you want some red wigglers, just give me a call. Because I'm raising them. Yeah. I have I hotels of them in my studio now. <laughs> Well, gives a whole new meaning to having a trash day. Um, on that sort of fun note, I think we'll start to close up the evening. And um, most of all, we want to thank all of our invisible <laughs> uh, participants, our guests, whose faces we can't see, but I can only imagine I, I, so many of you I know, so I have a wonderful joy of that. And the three faces on here um, Phil and Stephen and Tam, Tam um, it's been fantastic to work with the three of you. Um, this is, you know, my second time doing a, a project with Tam and, you know, and meeting Stephen and Phil and your students and it's inspired and um, I adore working with Suvan. She's a friend of over almost more than 30 years, we'll just say we started as we started in kindergarten, right? <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> go that route. But um, most of all, I also want to introduce and thank um, Karen Schiffman, if you can bring her in, Tim, or uh, so she's on uh, on the screen with us. Karen is um, the longtime. She's sort of the, the drumbeat of the Southern California Women's Caucus for Art. And she's an art historian and becoming an artist. And she is just, um, uh, anyway, she, I wanted her to have a few words because um, the women's, SEWCI has played an important role in both of the exhibitions we've been able to produce. So um, Karen, welcome. Hi, good evening. I just wanna say it was, I really enjoyed the conversation this evening. I had the great privilege of seeing the exhibition on the opening day, and I very, very impressed and, and touched by the issues that were addressed there by the artists. So, so I just want to say on behalf of the Women's Caucus, you know, thank you to Santa Ana College, to Philip and Timothy for the opportunity to spread our wings a little bit into the South part of California, further Southern California, and of course, to the amazing artists who, you know, shared their 
talents and wisdom. So thank you very much. And I, I, I do want to say one thing. One of the things that stood out to me is that the day I was there, I know that um, there were some students in there. And I know there's been a lot of interaction from the students on the campus with the exhibit. And so that um, very much warms our hearts because we do care deeply about outreach and um, that, you know, that is part of our mission. So thank you again for, for all of it. And especially to the artists, not that Suvan and Sandra don't deserve the kudos, but without those artists, we wouldn't be here. And we were just privileged to have had them share their work for the show. So thank you very much. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. And Suvan, you want to do a quick share of your screen? Of, do you... So if anyone wants to take a picture of this, a, a screen pic, um, can you make it a little larger? Or... I will try. OK. Uh, let's see or maybe on your own, own screens, you can do that for yourself. Um, but yeah, these are suggestions. <laughs> and we'll try to. Um, Maybe if you can copy, can you copy paste it into the into the chat? Would that work? I will try to do that too. Okay. It could do a screen capture too. A screen capture, yeah. I'll go grab one. Yeah, I can't do that. No problem. Okay. Let me take a these, quick. These are the, these, we asked the artists if there were books that they want or some kind of material that they wanted to share. I mean, when you're having a conversation with friends, sometimes they're, oh, I just read the best book or that kind of thing. So um, we asked the artists if there were books that they wanted to share, readings of any kind, things that inspire, things that uh, they just turn to for, you know, insight for whatever for enjoyment. And these were what we're, everybody gave us and Sandra and I included our own in there. Uh, please, if you if you wanna have a copy of it, uh, hopefully Sandra can get it into wherever. Yeah, I can, I can email those that um, if you, you know, I think if someone's got, if we, we will be able to tell who's been with us on the participants and uh, between Suvan and I, I think probably most people are known to us, so we can send it out to you as a as just as a um, a screenshot. So we'll do go that route, or we could read it. I mean, why don't we just? Would that be too direct? Well, I don't know. About, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I frankly, when somebody reads a bunch of stuff at me, it just slides okay. up the Teflon brain. But um, yeah, we'll, if if you're interested in having it, we or we can just send it to everybody who came. What the heck? Okay, we'll just go that route. That sounds great. And um, has got her hand up. I was just going to say that one of my books, A Thousand Crimes of Ming Su, is actually kind of more of a revenge book. <laughs> it is a, about the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. It was a, it's about a, 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 it's a revenge, it's more of a revenge book, That's but great. it's a beautiful, um, um, yeah, um, it's a, yeah, well, it's beautifully to do it. If each person wants to just say what they put in it, then it makes it more personal. Then we'll get it. Yeah, <laughs> and it'll be in the recording too because we should be able to get that. Um, Kim, you had one, and and also Karen, uh, Karen, Karen. I didn't get your last name because it went past real fast. Had her hand up. Oh, Fair Schwager. Um. She had a raised hand. I don't know. Yeah, I think uh, we'll have to. Uh, shall we unmute her and allow? We can her unmute to... her. She can speak. Yes, that, that would be great. Let me try and get that cook in here. Let's see. Uh... She's unmuted. Go ahead, Karen. Hey. Well, uh, it's Foyer Schwager. Sorry. <laughs> no, you don't have to be sorry. It's a long name. I don't like it. Um. I was just looking at these books and I, I was wondering if anybody would be willing to have, um, we'll start at the top and go down to the bottom and have a book group. Oh, wow. 
a bit tall order, a lot of books. A lot. Right, right. Well, it's a great idea. I mean, it's um, that can, you know, I mean, Su Suvan, you had to Pilgrim on. I'm, at, a, I'm already in two book groups right now. I don't think I have room for it. I, yeah, I, I'm kind of with you there as well. Um, but well, we'll try and get these out, you know, to everyone. Um, I appreciate the offer. Right. I think one that sounds in inspiring to me is uh, from Pamela, There, There by Tommy Orange. I'm oh, that's a great book. I I'm immensely it. curious on that and, and in need of a new book. So there we go. <laughs> yeah, I love that book. I, I added two more. In oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't realize we could add more because I- Oh, sure. <laughs> Uh, Break well, the rules, Pamela. Come on. <laughs> what What are your other two? Or put them in the chat if you want. Yeah, Think Again by Adam Grant and Postcolonial Love Poems by Natalie Diaz. Oh, ah, yes. wonderful. Yeah, did you put them in the chat? Yeah, they're there. Thank I you. I did. Okay. okay. As long as I've got this on the screen, I can't go there. Okay. And, and we now know what play has captured Linda. Um, I, um, as I said before, I've been reading uh, plays. <clears throat> the Emperor Jones uh, actually launched Paul Robeson's career in the American theater, African-American actor that uh, before that there was a lot of blackface in American theater and he was the first superstar uh, African-American superstar on Broadway, off-Broadway and on Broadway playing the Emperor Jones. And uh, my uh, interest in this particular piece is that a lot of times uh, communities of color are not allowed to have pathos. We have to be the happy-go-lucky Indian, the happy-go-lucky Mexican, the happy-go-lucky Hawaiian without any troubles and always very complacent about our circumstances. And this particular play really shows um, uh, uh, a cruel and evil leader, African American, it actually shows him as a human being, as a because a, a, a community that's fully healthy has good people, bad people, wise people, not so wise people. There's 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 aspects to to communities that are often negated and not allowed to exist. And so uh, I suggested the Emperor Jones because it really can begin a conversation about pathos in uh, communities of color to, 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 uh, to reignite their humanity, to allow them their humanity. Good. Cool. And uh, let's see, Kim, did you wanna say anything about the Outlaw Bible of American Poetry? I love oh, yeah. that title. Um, you know, part of the reason I guess I, well, I love poet, poets, poems. I, a lot of you know when I curate shows, I always have a poetry section of people reading and, and doing their readings. Um, uh, anyway, I always admire them, but I did happen at Beyond Baroque when this book came out to hear a reading of any of the local poets. And um, it starts with kind of the beat generation poetry and um, Ellen maybe some of you may know of her work. She's a younger poet. Um, John Thomas and Philomene are in that book. And some of those poems, uh, like the John Thomas, uh, he's got a great poem called, You're Gonna Hate Me for Telling You This. And I used to read it to my students every semester. Um, it's really about the difficulties that creative people have. Uh, he's never gonna get his teeth fixed. He's never gonna have the money. And his uh, partner, Philomene, she wants these beautiful shoes and she's probably never gonna get these shoes from him because I mean, he. we're talking about starving poets, not even starving. Artists have stuff to sell, okay? <laughs> poets gotta really admire the stamina of them. So anyway, it's it's such a uh, variety of collection of poems and some are very long, almost more like prose. And uh, I just highly recommend it. You wouldn't read it, you know, front cover to back cover. You just kind of pick out things along the way. And I, I just always get so inspired by that 
I, I get inspired by art that's not in the kind of art I do. Like when I get always anxious when I go to a show, <laughs> you know, like an art exhibition, right? It, there's a little anxiety that happens when I'm seeing art exhibitions, whereas poetry, dance, theater, uh, films, I, I just get so much inspiration from them that then feeds my work. So that's where I come from with it. <laughs> Thank you. Sandra, do you want to say anything about either undermining or engaging emergence? Well, I think it's a very short volume, but the Lucy Lepard undermining is uh, through the motif of mining, um, where she now lives in New Mexico, is a brilliant um, sort of analysis of where we are politically. You know, she's one of those authors that you can read for her syntax. And I'm someone when something resonates, I make note of it because I think it's so hard to put into words something that really captures. So she's, I have always loved Lucy Lepard and that's brilliant. And The Engaging Emergence is a wonderful book on, um, it's basically a facilitation book but it's it's about engaging differences and it looks like we may have have ended <laughs> uh, i'm sorry i just stopped sharing because i wanted to see everybody's face before we ended oh okay um well there we go um bring it <laughs> <laughs> welcome so and 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 i discovered that because i feel like that's what i love to do i mean my first paintings were oil and ink I mean, it's always, it's about how to intermix. And I know that to some degree for myself, I do art to have the conversation, but I love, I love when there are, when things aren't, I like symmetry in one way and another way I want it to be a little off kilter, not complete. So um, both of those are, are descriptive, um, inspiring to me. Okay, well, that's our time for this evening. I really want to thank everybody who came tonight, both uh, as a participant and as uh, an attendee. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation. I always, I admire your work. You know that already. Wouldn't have put you in the show if I didn't. And um, I'm just delighted that I had this opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. i have a conversation with you. As always, uh, your smiling faces make me happy. Uh, and we're talking about art and we're talking about the earth, two of my favorite things. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good night. Oh. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> good night. <laughs>